verse 17. Blessed is the man whom God corrects. So do not despise the discipline of the Almighty, for he wounds, but he binds up. He injures, but his hand also heals. From six calamities he'll rescue you, and seven no harm will befall you. In famine he will rescue you from death, and in battle from the stroke of the sword. You will be protected from the lash of the tongue, and need not fear when destruction comes. You will lack of destruction and famine, and need not to fear of the beast of the earth, for you will have a covenant with the stones of the field. And the wild animals will be at peace with you, and you will know that your tent is secure. You will take stock in your property and find nothing missing. You will know that your children will be many, and your descendants will be like the grass of the earth. You will come to the grave in full vigor like sheaves gathered in season. We have examined this, and it is true. So hear it and apply it to yourself. That's right. Lord, we thank you for the day that you've given us and the chance to study your word. God is in all truth. Help us to apply it. Okay, we're beginning the new uh, quarter. We finished up our book on old uh, study of Elijah last week. This week the uh, text is going to come from what they call the, the, uh, the books of poetry. I've heard them called other things. But books of poetry is one way to look at it. That's basically what we're going to look at is some things related to that. We're going to look at some selections from Job, which is about man's suffering and God and how that all goes together. We're going to look at some selections from Psalms that David and others wrote in forms of praise and uh, ways to glorify God. We're going to look at some Proverbs, which is the wisdom of Solomon and some others that have been there. We're going to look at some things from Ecclesiastes are some warnings from what is referred to as the wisest man in the world. And then we'll look at some, a couple of excerpts from Lamentations, which talks about the misery that sin produces and how the end results of uh, causes that kind of a life of a person. When we look at this literature, we need to understand it's about flowery language. That's the way I wrote it. The writer didn't do that. I call it that for this and that. Um, basically, it's full of imagery. It's, it's intended to uh, make things kind of come out at you and to emphasize and just those kind of things and whatever there. Figures of speech, a lot of times you'll see it in songs. In the Bible, you'll see it in prayers. You'll see it in poet, poetry and where they write their poems and everything. And basically, it's intended to both, uh, basically just to bring out a uh, provoke some thought or praise because it's intended to kind of emphasize something when it's written that way or whatever. Uh, I've got a note down here that says, I am not a poet and I know it. <laughs> well, I was thinking this is not engineering. And in parentheses it says, I'm an engineer. <laughs> Thank you. This is not really up my alley. As a matter of fact, when we have our Valentine's thing over there, I do real good at the cooking. When it comes to reading that poems and all that stuff, I said, uh, you all handle that. I did. Well, actually, I won it two years in a row. It's time for me to give it to somebody else. <laughs> anyway, but when it comes to poetry, everybody knows. And then they look at me and I'm going, go look at me. Ask my wife. She will say she's never heard anything from me. Did anyone get a song that I could do on a remake or what do you call it, was a mixtape? It didn't happen, because somebody else had to come up with it, I didn't. That's just not me. So, so uh, hopefully we'll get through this. What I'm trying to do is to kind of look at these things and the emphasis that is being brought out in the lessons that, are being, that we're going through, and look at those, because the idea is to make it in something that's in, that impacts us and provokes thought and, uh, and, uh, and all praise for God for who he is or whatever. So we're going to look at those things, and I'm going to try to get us to that particular point. One of the things I want to point out before we do that is this. The Bible is inspired, and the writings are inspired, but sometimes the things that are said are not true. Okay? For example, we have quotations of people saying things in the Bible that 
were inspired to write it in there that we know very clearly by the context that they were wrong when they said it and they were even brought down for it or chastised for it or whatever. So there are some things that are said in the Bible that are not true even though it's inspired. But if you look at the context, you should be able to understand what is God's being said and what's not. Uh, example of that went through my mind. What was it? Um, Job's friends. Job's friends. Well, that's the first one we talked about. That's the reason I bring it out. It's because this speech, this uh, thing that we see here, this poem or, that was written here, is written by one of his friends. And it's obviously from his point of view. And as we go through that whole book of Job, we see that there, he's half right. And the part he's right about is because why? What's his view? Man's view. So he doesn't see the other half that we see in, in the first couple chapters of what else is going on beyond what he can see. So a lot of things that are written, and this is a perfect example of those kind of things. Uh, another kind of one that came to my mind is uh, the whole duty of man is to what? Who said that? Solomon. Solomon in Ecclesiastes, after he used the book of Ecclesiastes. Maybe we'll touch on that on another couple of Ecclesiastes. But that's not what God said. It is a true statement, but that is not the whole duty. If you go to Genesis chapter 3 and 2, the whole duty was to trust God. Just put yourself in this. Now, what Solomon says is a part of that. But God said, all I want you to do is trust me. Don't trust yourself. You go to Romans chapter... One, and you ask Paul what the gospel is and what the whole duty of God man is. It's all about faith. But you trust in him. And from the beginning to the end of the Bible, that's what it's really about. And there's a million things that go into that. So when Solomon said that, even though it was a true statement, that was not the whole duty. The whole duty was to just follow in God's hands and let him take care of it. Which included that. Okay. Without, so that, I'm just using those as an illustration to make us understand that as we read these things, there are things that are good that we get out of we need to understand the context it comes from. All right, with that said, let's move on. All right, so we're starting off in, uh, what chapter is this? Chapter 5. Chapter 5, starting verse 6 to 17. Uh, New King James says, And what he's bringing out is the, the concept 
concept of discipline in our world is, is mixed up. Because when we talk about discipline, most people associate it with the word punishment. Punishment is a part of it, discipline sometimes, but discipline is different than that. One thing he brought out was this. Discipline demonstrates that a person is loved. If you don't love them, you wouldn't take the time to do it. You wouldn't put, exert yourself or get yourself in the middle of it. It has nothing to do with you. You could care less. I worry about me. But if I care about you and I want an outcome from you, discipline says that I care more than just like you. Like you, okay, you're a friend. That's what you want to do. Okay, whatever. You know? Do we have people we do that with? Sure. That's the way you want to live your life? All right. On the other hand, a deep agape type love says, whatever's not okay. Whatever's not okay. You're my son. It's not okay for you to end up like that. And so therefore, when I discipline my son, it's because I love him and I don't want that long term, that deep, that end of the road happiness or unhappiness that he's really talking about here. So because of love is a motivator. Yes, one more real thing. My, my dad used to say to me before he gave me a whooping, my punishment, this is going to hurt me more than it does you. As a child, that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever to me. How is my getting a whooping making you hurt more than me? My fourth point of contact hurts. Yep. And we never believed so it. Until I became a father myself and had to bend out punishment. Now, all right. Another thing discipline does is it provides boundaries. It says this is okay, this is not okay. And by providing boundaries, it's going to bring happiness. Maybe not fun, because within those, outside those boundaries may be fun, exciting, as all the commercials will tell you. But true happiness is found within a certain set of boundaries. That's why we draw those boundaries for our children. It's probably the best way to understand this, is like we pointed out, it's with our kids or whatever. It's because when we do that, it is beneficial to them and it helps them to have a long, happy life. Now, so, uh, and when we look at this, think about God as being our Father. Who created us? God did. When He created us to be like who? Him. If we're not acting like Him, and we're not created to be different from Him, things that we do that are outside of that realm will not bring us happiness. They might bring us fun for a moment, but then the, the end result comes up. You wake up the next morning, you know, the end result comes around. All right, so even though we can see a value, does anybody want it? No. Even when we're wrong, we know we probably ought to be called down or disciplined or whatever. We, we're not going to volunteer, right? I've never seen a person volunteer and say, oh yeah, I was wrong. Chastise me. Doesn't happen. That's because suffering is suffering no matter what. No matter how short a time it is, it's still suffering. So you don't volunteer. All right? Instead, what one should do when God disciplines us is what? Accept it and do what? <coughs> Make a change. Make a change. All discipline, when we discipline our children, is to do what? Because we, we just love it? Sometimes, maybe. <laughs> but really, we do it because we want them to change something to cause them to come back within the boundaries that are good, that will bring about happiness. God does the same thing. So we need to turn back to God and we need to trust Him. That's all He's ever wanted us to do is trust Him. Just like our father, just like our dad. He wants, he wants us to trust Him. So we need to use this, turn back to Him and trust Him. As fellow players seeing this in some of God, seeing another person being disciplined, how, how should we react? What should we do when, when somebody is dealing with the repercussions of the sin or whatever they were involved in? Pile on. Pile on. That's the church way, isn't it? Look at our own lives. Yeah, look at our own lives first and realize, whoops, I just made it out without that happening to me. And instead, we need 
need to encourage them, support them to make the change. And many times, as was pointed out, and I think it's a valid thing, we have a tendency to pile up. We have a tendency to say, well, you got what you deserve, didn't you? Serves you right. How many expressions can I quote that are really related to that? That's something we should be doing, is asking, what can I do? As a matter of fact, the Bible talks about to correct a brother or help a brother to change. It, is, it talks about how great a value that is. But a lot of times we do that in the way that we come on there and we pile on, you know, ostracized, talk down, tell talk about them, do all kinds of other things. So we need to be one that's there that's supporting and encouraging. Actually, the gentleman uh, here that's quoted, that we're reading about here, that's what he thought he was trying to do, in a way. But he was also kind of piling on, and the things he was saying was kind of digging, because what he was saying here is really not true for Job's case. God was not disciplined, Job. But we are talking about discipline today, so we're not talking about the actual situation of Job. We're talking about discipline. But that's what he thought he was doing, even though he really wasn't. Instead, he was just poking and saying, you got a problem you need to fix. And that wasn't being helpful. So we need to consider that. Is there a difference between discipline and punishment? Absolutely. Absolutely. Punishment is justice for a wrong. Justice, is, I mean, punishment is a justice for a wrong. That's important because is God just? Absolutely, therefore there is punishment. However, discipline is an action to cause a change. Is God loving? Absolutely. Now we've got two things that kind of contradict each other here. This is where the problem comes in in man's mind. But you see, God is, when he disciplines a person, it's about to bring an action that causes things to happen to an individual to cause them to rethink what they're doing, and to come back within the boundaries of the confines that he's given them. Okay? Does God punish? Yes. And sometimes there is a punishment involved in that discipline, just like in our children's lives. Sometimes the discipline includes a punishment, does it not? Yeah, sometimes it's not really much of a punishment as much as it is a restructuring of their life to kind of get them to say, okay, I will go that way. You know, and we do that too. So there are both. The fact of the matter is, punishment can be part of discipline, but it's not necessarily what discipline is. Discipline is more than just that. This, uh, the fact of the matter is, God is a just God. He's also a loving God. Today, the emphasis on discipline has to do with the fact that He's a loving God and trying to get us to change our ways before we have to go and there is that final eternal punishment. So that's what he's trying to do. All right. Goes on and talks about the discipline of the Almighty. My version says Almighty. The word there is El Shaddai. You know what song's about that? It means God Almighty. That's what El Shaddai, God Almighty. It talks about his power. As a matter of fact, Job it refers to, uses this term about 15 times, use it a lot. So we start looking about the discipline of the all-powerful. We start looking at this and we start asking ourselves some questions. Why does God discipline us? I think we answered that briefly a minute ago. The first reason is He loves us. He loves His children. Just like we love our children, therefore we discipline our children. No difference. We don't want our children to end up down the road in a place that, that, that we don't want them to be. So we discipline them. God disciplines us so that we don't end up in a place down the road where we, he doesn't want us to be. It's that simple. He wants us to be what we were created to be. And we were created to be holy. A lot of times when we've talked about it in the past, when it says we were created in God's image, I point out that God doesn't look like this. We are created to look like God who is a spirit full of love Full of holiness. That's the God we were created in the image of. That's what our soul, our spirit looks like, is in his image. So we are created to be in his image. And he wants us to be exactly what he created us to be. Holy. Just like him. His son. His daughter. And when we're not, we're going against our whole being and what we are. And when we go against our whole being, what happens? Chaos, problems, all kinds of things when we 
we don't live as the person, as what we are. You know? You ever tried to take a dog and turn it into a horse? It doesn't work. <coughs> you know? Because a horse is a horse and a dog is a dog, and as us, as children of God, we are created to be like him. And when we are outside and trying to act in a different way than what we are created, it causes us unhappiness. It causes us pain. It causes ramifications that are even more painful than a physical one. So we need to understand that. Uh, the purpose of discipline with punishment sometimes is to cause change or repentance. Um, one of the things I think about, and I'm going to ask you bit how God disciplined us next, but one of the things I think about is all through the Bible, when Look at the children of Israel, God's physical people. When they drifted away and they came outside those boundaries, what did God do? He brought them back, or no, he didn't bring them back, but he gave them a reason to go back. You know, he didn't say, here, and drag them, kicking and screaming over here. He said, okay, fine. Cut off the crops. <laughs> Brought in the, the neighboring uh, enemy. Uh, brought in uh, famine and plague and all these different things. As a matter of fact, in Leviticus, uh, that's the next question, I guess. How does God discipline us? Well, he tells us. In Leviticus uh, chapter 26, he says, if you don't live within these boundaries, here's what's going to happen. And he goes through a whole chapter of how he's going to do this, and if that doesn't work, he's going to do this, and if that don't work, he's going to do this, and just on and on and on and on. And uh, Jeremiah quotes him uh, later on by saying that he brings a uh, sword, famine, and plague. Matter of fact, I think he mentions it multiple times. I think thirty something times in the book of Jeremiah. After they've already on the precipice, on the end of Israel, you know, Israel's about gone. He says God's going to bring both justice and discipline upon you through sword, famine, and plague. On um, Wednesday night, we're studying Revelation. Revelation chapter 8, I think. 6. 6, 8. Uh, talks about God bringing sword, famine, and plague upon them. Uh, first in the first century, as we're looking at uh, Wednesday night, and also into the future and all other applications. God uses this method in this world in order to cause us, first of all, to get back in the bounds, to change. Ultimately, that doesn't work. What happens? We reap the repercussions and we end up dealing with final punishment. That's what he says over and over again. In the case of Israel, here in Leviticus, he's telling them, here's what's going to happen if you get out of these bounds and you walk away from me and you don't do what, you, what I've, you've been called to do. And we see throughout Israel history, he does that over and over again. And then Jeremiah, at the end of Israel's history, pretty much, uh, Jeremiah is saying, yep, it's about to really happen. Sword, famine, and plague. And he goes on to show how, and Jeremiah, I think it is, also how he used that throughout the world, not just on his people. So we see that these are the things that God uses to discipline us. In this particular text, it says he wounds us, he injures us. But it also binds us up and heals us. Why? It's not punishment. It's intended to be discipline. He wants to, to do these things and cause these things to happen to make you think to come back, but then he's going to heal you, make you well. It's not permanent. He brings six calamities or disasters, but it says he's going to protect you from the Sabbath. It's intended to bring about a change. He's going to bring famine and sword. But it won't bring death. Pain, yes. Death, no. Why? Because what we're talking about here is God disciplined our own lives. Alright? Now he also goes on and tells them they don't have to fear destruction. Why? Do what? Because he's with them. That's right. He will rescue them. The destroyer, he's not the destroyer. Satan is. He's their rescuer. And that's what he says. He's there to rescue you. He is there to restore you. 
Because the discipline is not about the punishment for the crime. It's not about justice. It's about change. And God disciplines those that he loves. His children. His people. That's what we're talking about. Here. Because of discipline, he wants us to change. So he turns around and he'll take those things and ultimately he's there to rescue you. Ultimately there he's to restore you. Even though there will be much pain and suffering to get you to change, it's not the end. Because it's about the change. That makes sense? That's what he says in all these verses that we just read when he starts to go one, one example and then he turns around and says, yeah, but you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, you don't have to fear it. Yeah, you don't. I'm sitting there thinking, fear? You just got done saying that you're going to do what? I don't have to fear that? Yeah, but. The but is, on the end of it is, he's not there to bring justice. He's there to bring discipline. And we need to look at just the discipline in our lives. That's what? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, that's one of the reasons we have this. And all these examples have been ahead of us. I mean, what is history good for? Nothing. A warning. You know, I mean, even historians say we're doomed to repeat if we don't study it. I mean, that's in the secular world. We have the warnings. We have the things that say, look, here's what happens when you go your way. And here's what happens when you go my way. That's, that's, so we have all that. Because he really doesn't want us to suffer. Does God really want us to be in pain? Do you want your children to be in pain? No. Do you hurt when your children hurt? Absolutely. God's the same way. Create his life. You remember it. All right. So, is all suffering about discipline? Every time you suffer, is it about discipline? No. See, that's where this guy was wrong. Statements he made were true about God and discipline, but his application to Job was incorrect. Because Job was not being disciplined. The Bible clearly said before that he was an upright and righteous man, and God had nothing against him. Nothing. There was no justice to be met out there. There was nothing there, nothing to correct. Job was a good man. So this was not a direct, really accurate in its context as directed toward Job. However, in that man's mind, he was searching for answers, and that sounded like a good one to him, because he knows God knows discipline. So what he said is correct, just not in this correct application, because he couldn't see, he, he couldn't judge correctly. I mean, we've times we've talked about not being able to see clear enough to judge. It's the same situation. Alright? So the answer is, is all suffering about discipline? Absolutely not. First of all, Suffering comes from my sin. When I do things, when I sin and do something I shouldn't, it brings about suffering on myself, does it not? You know? It's too much of that good life and then suddenly you don't have a liver. Too much of that good life, it can be an accident and maimed for life. I mean, you can go on. I'm just picking on that one particular example because it's really easy. But the, every single sin out there, that if I am involved in sin, it has a ramification for me. I got there yet. I'm talking about me. My actions affect me. So number one, we need to understand that my sin affects me and brings on my own pain and suffering. Should I blame God? I'm the one that did it. Didn't he tell me not to, to be involved in sin? Didn't he warn me? Didn't he try to discipline me and push me away from there? Yeah. But ultimately, sometimes, my own suffering is my own fault. Because of my sin. The next case that is mentioned here is suffering comes from the sins of others. And you take that same example of alcohol abuse. And we talked about the other person driving drunk and hitting your family bringing pain and suffering on your family. You know? So sometimes suffering is not something I had anything to do with. It was brought upon me because somebody else chose to sin. They stepped outside of God's bounds. They didn't do what he said. They didn't live the way he wanted. And I'm paying the price for it. 
because of the way they've done, what they have done, the actions that they have taken. We, uh, we did foster care for many years. One of the biggest problems that we deal with in foster care, aside from the physical abuse of children, is most of these kids are born damaged because their parents sinned, abused drugs, alcohol, lifestyle, whatever you want to call it, the things they did outside that boundaries. And the children are paying the consequences because they're born damaged. Damaged. We have more and more of that in this country every day. And it's not a result of that child's sin. They didn't do anything. Instead, it was the parents. You know, with the fetal alcohol syndrome. Some are born addicted to drugs when they're born and have to be dried out before they're even old enough to crawl. Some of them don't even make it. That's when the child's at fault. But it does go back to sin. Everyone else is sin. Okay? So, suffering in my life comes about because of my own sinful choices. Sin in my life, I mean, suffering in my life comes about the sinful choices of others. Sometimes it's neither one. Sometimes I happen to be in uh, New Orleans when a hurricane came through. Sometimes I have to be in uh, Chattanooga when a tornado came through. Sometimes I have to be in Mexico City when an earthquake happened, or Haiti, or whatever. Nobody did anything there, it appears. So what's the problem? What caused that? Any ideas? Give me a hint. Genesis chapter 3. What happened in Genesis chapter 3? Mankind sinned. Mankind made a decision to go away from what trusting in God and decided to trust themselves. The sin of Adam. It's referred to in Romans and other places. The sin of mankind basically choosing to reject God at that moment took us from what kind of life were we living in? Paradise. Perfect. Did you have any earthquakes? No. Did you have to toil and sweat just to eat? No. You didn't have any of that. But when Adam sinned, mankind sinned, his sin brought into this world death and decay. Wasn't that the promise? And Satan said, ah, you're not really going to die. But isn't that what God said? The minute you do it, you will die. When he talked about dying, he was talking about dying spiritually. He was talking about dying physically. He was talking about the world you know it is dying. Dead, 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 dead. Everything would be as in, I think it was second law of thermodynamics. No, it's the first. Basically, it says everything's going to, a, to death. It's decaying. Nothing gets better, always gets worse. That's basically what it says. There's nothing in this world that's getting better. That's why uh, Kirk talks about uh, the creation and how it's impossible for things to just happen. Because nothing happens better, which is ironic that these scientists think that when their own basic laws that they know say it doesn't do that. It gets worse. Everything. And so we sit there and we look at that and we see that suffering comes from the set of Adam. Disasters, whether they're natural or, or man-made, like a plane crash or something, man trying to make something perfect, and he can't make something perfect because it's not possible. These things are caused because mankind as a whole sinned in the beginning. And he put this whole world in uh, chaos. You'll remember, and it's in the New Testament, I should have looked it up, but I didn't. They were talking about... Uh, Jesus may have been the one saying it, but they were talking about the whole world was groaning. Maybe it's Paul. Groaning. The earth was physical earth. Not the people. The earth was groaning as it was going toward destruction. Longing for the day that God would restore it and the death would end because this whole world is dying. Physically, this earth is dying. The creation is dying. And that's what's causing these earthquakes, is it decays and dies. We have earthquakes, we have hurricanes, we have all these things that never existed before. So, we can see that suffering 
does not always come from discipline. It comes from the sins of me. My sins cause it. My suffering. Your sins cause my suffering. And Adam's sin causes my suffering. Most of the sufferings in the world can be attributed to the back to that. Just about everything. I'm going to say, I challenge you to say any different. That suffering comes from sin. In some form, some place, somewhere, there was sin that caused that suffering in our life. Disease? There was no disease in the garden. As the body started decaying and reacting with all the other decaying things in the world, suddenly we had disease. Suddenly we had certain things unchecked. You know? So all that comes from that. Another law of thermodynamics. For every cause there's an equal and opposite reaction. Guess what? For every cause, and I'm trying to preach this to my daughter all the time. For every cause, there is a response. There is something that happens. There is a consequence. Every action, there is a consequence. I don't care what it is, good or bad, there's an action. I'm trying to get her to understand that. If, you, if you're supposed to get up at 8, and you get up at 9, and you got to be there at 9.30, there's a consequence. You only got 30 minutes to cram it all in, or you're going to go hungry. Simple stuff. Take that into the big world picture. There's a cause, there's an action, and every time sin enters this world, there's an action there. And every single time there's a consequence. Every time. Every time. So I want to finish with a couple quick questions. The first one is, you hear this in philosophy, you hear this in the world, when people reject God, they say, well, how can a loving God allow or cause the good to suffer? You ever heard that? Tough question, isn't it? How can he do it? First, let's ask the question, who is good? Oh, there's your first problem. See, we define good differently. You know, he attends church once a week. He's nice, he gives some money. He doesn't uh, do drugs and run around and get arrested, so he's a good guy. Not to say that. You speak angrily and suddenly to your friend, to your wife, you treat people wrong, you ignore people, whatever you do. There's all kinds of things that are not godly. And God is good. We're not good. So first of all, there's no one good or righteous amongst us. However, is God? He is good. I used the term a minute ago. He was not a just God. Let me think, think this through. What if God was not a just God and he said, well, whatever. How would you feel if the person who killed your spouse, friend, whatever, child, whatever, got away with it because there is no justice? Would that be right? Would you believe in a God that didn't believe in a justice and making things right? No. It would be chaos. There is a right because God is right. There is a just because God is just. And you want him to be. Believe me. It's not with you. you know, we want to be just with all of you guys, but not with me. Yeah? That's the problem. The next thing is, uh, God does not do evil. No matter what we think, even when he disciplines us, and we have these situations come upon us, God didn't bring that evil upon us. Who did? Satan. How does it take place? you hint. Job chapter 1 and 2. Satan is there challenging God and says, God says, okay. In his case, it's Job. It's a righteous man. He's a testing. But Satan did, the, did every single thing in the book of Job. God did not do one thing. In our lives, the, for the things that happen because of sin are things that God didn't do. Who did it? Satan more sin, and can stir up more chaos and more whatever, the more suffering there is. God doesn't do evil, Satan does. God does allow. But he only allows for one reason. First of all, he gave us a choice. 
He gave us a choice. Now, we could be a bunch of robots, but we're not. We're his children. He gave us a choice. And man, use that choice to trust in his own abilities to decide what was okay and what was not. Heard in the garden, it happens right through our lives, our individual lives, every single day. How many times do we make a decision without really thinking about what God would say? Be honest with yourself. You may be really good most of the time you do think of it. I guarantee you the reason we are not good and not perfect is because there are times we don't think it all the way through. God would say. So God allows these things to happen as a ramification for the choices that He's allowed us to make. It's not that He allows it because He likes to see misery and suffering. He allows it because He says, you decide. So when we want to blame somebody for our circumstances, who do we blame? Me. Me. I'm sorry. My uncle has cancer. My mother died of cancer. None of those were something that I would wish on anybody. It's a result of sin in the beginning. It caused all these things. Does God love it? No. Does he allow it? Yes. Why? Man made the choice. He wanted us to have the choice. And at the same time, he gives each and every one of them a choice what to do with it. And each and every one of us what to do with the messes we get ourselves into. Do we want to come back in? Use it as a form to warn us and discipline us, or do we want to use it to just go our own way and reject it? Blame it on him. You know why we blame it on God? How many likes to blame it on yourself? So blame it on God. That's what the world does. That's what Mary Beth does. I said, I don't care what they did. What did you do? Yeah, but. Yeah, but, 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 but. What did you do? You made the decision. That's the problem we have here. So when we look at suffering and things in this world, it's because God gave us a choice and we made it. And the last thing is this. Can God change the outcome of sin and suffering? Yes. How should I? All power. Does he always? No. Can he? Absolutely. That's why he tells us to talk to him, tells us to pray to him, whatever. He can do anything. Uh, somewhere in there, he's got a lot of things to deal with. He's got to deal with justice, too. The good news is, when it comes to justice, he's already solved that problem in my life. Justice has already been met. Okay? So now you can concentrate on love. You know? And so that's already been met for those who are willing to stay within the boundaries that he's trying to draw. Try to live with the life and trust in him. Um, and then, of course, one of the things we fail to take into context is all things are within his will. Sometimes he changes things and does things and makes people well or, not or whatever because wants to, but everything fits within his will. Nothing bothers me more than somebody coming up with somebody's deal with a lot of pain and suffering and say, all things work together for good. For those who love him and call him for his purpose. So God's going to make it work out for you. I'm sorry, ask Peter, who's crucified upside down. Ask Paul, who was abused all his life. That's not what he's saying. He says, for those who love the Lord and are called for his purpose, a group the people, not necessarily Paul as an individual, but for his church. All the things that Paul went through in his life furthered God's will for his people. Without it, there wouldn't be this. Paul would never have gone through all these places. All the persecution and things he went through is in order to the gospel be spread. So sometimes it's not about me, which, by the way, is always about me. You know what we always say? Reality is God's not talking about me. He's talking about his people. And he works for his will. So sometimes the things he chooses are within there. All right. Time's up. Uh, appreciate it. Last blank.